To tell the story of Biafra, one would have to begin with the advent of colonialism in the late 1800s and the amalgamation of the North and South in 1914. Nigeria, like other African countries, was carved out of West Africa. Different people, with different tongues, brought together by virtue of their proximity and asked to become one nation. 300 different ethnic groups and languages were represented, the majority of which were Aousa, Igbo, and Yoruba. These three major tribes differed in their economic values, religious tendencies, and their approach to education and politics. The Aousas being less influenced by the colonialism, the Yorubas being the first to embrace education, and the Igbos resistant at first, but eventually widely accepting of education and Christianity. These differences would become exposed after independence and would come to head with the events of 1966. After independence in 1960 and by 1964, when the time came for the elections to be held, it became increasingly clear that the North held the most power and decisions could not be made without them. Many politicians were corrupt and sought to maintain power by whatever means necessary. The election was wrought with fraud and ballot box stuffing was the order of the day. The army who had been deployed to police the elections saw the goings on and were usually asked by citizens to intervene. This corruption was so widespread and was allegedly the reason for the first coup. In January 1966, 29-year-old Major Chukuma Kaduna Nzogu and other military officers led a group of northern soldiers to attack and kill the prime minister, the premiers of the north and western region, and top army officers from the northern and western regions of the country. At the end of the exercise, we took them out and showed them various places where they were to stand and just remain in the vehicle. The next day, we went out again for the same type of exercise, and at the end, we issued them with ammunition this time, live ammunition, and told them that they were going back to the same place as they went yesterday, but this time they were to get certain people. And they were with you, were they? Oh, of course they did. Oh, they all supported us. Notably exempt from this cool kill list were the president, Nandi Azikiwe, who was on vacation in the West Indies, and other Igbo officers. Because of this, the coup became known then and is still referred to in most circles today as the Igbo coup. It is important to note, however, that not all the coup plotters were of Igbo descent and that some Igbo officers participated in stopping the coup. It was a failed one by all standards and ultimately suppressed in the South by the head of the army, Aguirre Rangsi. Nzogu was arrested and Aguye Ronsi declared himself the head of state and placed Nigeria under military rule. From the information at my disposal, the cabinet decided to transfer power to him as the general officer commanding the armed forces. It means an abdication of power. And, since, uh, and it means then the suspension of the president the Prime Minister, the four regional governors, and the four regional premiers. In other words, the civilian authorities have found it impossible to maintain law and order and have transferred same to the military authorities until law and order can be maintained. Are you or your cabinet setting a time limit on this assumption of power? I'm not in position to say because I wasn't there. But the acting president, in a telephone conversation to me, uh, merely mentioned that cabinet met and unanimously and voluntarily agreed to abdicate power. I'm assuming in the light of previous practice elsewhere in the world that it will be temporary. My main concern is to restore law and order as soon as possible. Ethnic tensions continued to rise when the coup plotters were not immediately punished 
Many felt that Aguirre Ronsi was either involved with the coup or had prior knowledge of the events. A counter coup was carried out by northern officers Muritala Mohamed and Theophilus Danjuma, and this resulted in the death of Aguirre Ronsi. Ironically, the northern officers' plans were to engineer a northern secession from Nigeria. However, they were dissuaded by advisors, including English and American ambassadors. Instead, they chose Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowan, a northern Christian, to become the next head of state. It was meant to be a sort of compromise for the country. As the governor of the eastern region since the time of the first coup, Lieutenant Colonel Odumegu Ojuku supported the forces that were loyal to Laguye Ronsi and therefore was unimpressed with the coup plotter's choice for head of state. He insisted that the position should go to an officer with a superior ranking to him and Gowan. His request was refused, and this led to the beginnings of a standoff that would lead to the war. At this time, anti Igbo sentiment arose in the north, with pogroms killing between 10 and 30,000 Igbos and causing a mass exodus back to Igbo land. The northerners targeted the Igbos because they felt that they were being overridden in their own land. The roads were littered with Igbo bodies, and the northern soldiers' goal was to eliminate Igbos. By early January 1967, the military leadership went to Aburi, Ghana in an attempt to promote unity within the military. They also met to discuss the tensions between the Northerners and Easterners and establish the way Nigeria would be ruled going forward. Even though there was shaking of hands and an agreement appeared to be reached, things fell apart during the implementation phase. And on May 27, 1967, Gowan divided the then eastern region into three parts, the southeastern state, river state, and east central state. This division would cause the Igbos, now primarily in the east central state, to lose control over the oil, which was in the southeastern state and the river state. It was a strategic attempt, attempt by the Nigerian government to shut down any secession attempts and destabilize the eastern region. Our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, well, the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get. Ojuku responded on May 30, 1967, by declaring the independence of the Republic of Biafra. Make no mistake, oil played a very big part in the war. The control of oil by Nigerians contributed heavily to their ability to buy more weapons and dominate in a way that Biafra couldn't even dream of doing. During the two and a half year war, Biafra had their own government, their own bank, their own currency, they recruited civilians to fight in the war. They made their own bombs, their own guns, had their own military. They were assisted by a few countries, including France, but were no match for the Nigerians. The Nigerians were supported by the Soviet Union, by Israel, and by the British, who had stakes in the oil extraction business. Nigeria imposed blockades on the Biafran states, causing widespread famine. The plight of the Biafrans was recognized as genocide around the world, and relief and aid came in from all over. By January 1970, after the fall of Oweri and Uli, Ojuku fled likely capture to Ivory Coast, and Biafra surrendered to Nigeria. Patrick Amadi, how are you? Excellent. Glad to see you again. Thank you very much. Glad to see you again. It's an experience. Honestly, glad to see you again. And I would like, therefore, to take this opportunity to say that I, Major General Philip Ephium, officer administering the government of the Republic of Biafra, now wish to make the following declaration. That we affirm we are loyal Nigerian citizens and accept the authority of the Federal Military Government of Nigeria. That we accept the existing administrative and political structure of the Federation of Nigeria. That any future constitutional arrangement will be worked out 
by representatives of the people of Nigeria that the Republic of Biafra hereby ceases to exist. The war was particularly damaging for the Igbos. Two million lives lost, displacement, loss of infrastructure, inability to return to former positions and recover properties and financial assets. Regardless of what was in the bank, Biafrans received 20 pounds to restart their lives. The Igbos truly had to rebuild. Years later, in 1999, agitation for Biafra started under the movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra, Masab, and more recently with the indigenous people of Biafra, led by Nnamdi Kanu. Their argument is that Biafrans will not tolerate continued marginalization by Nigeria, and that they want retribution for all the occurrences before, during, and after the war, and that Biafra basically wants out. The question for us today is, 50 years later, what do we want?